plentiful, but the labors are few. The harvest is ready, but the labors are few. We have to get in the mindset of revival, because revival is here. But we have to pray for it, we have to fast for it. Amen?
as Christians that some point in our walk, we all get persecuted for what we believe and for what we stand for, whether it's modesty or in Jesus' name, baptism. But I want everybody in this place to know that no matter what you go through, we have a God that's fighting for us. You guys don't sound like you believe it. We have a God that's fighting for us. The Bible says, hold your peace. And you'll make your enemies go scattered. You'll make them go away. So for anybody that might be dealing with persecution, we have a God that's going to fight your battles. That's all we can say. God is fighting for us. Pushing back the darkness. Lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. There's only one thing done. In the name of Jesus.
Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you thanksgiving this morning, Jesus. Hallelujah. Surely your presence is in this place today, God. Touch every individual. Speak to every heart here today, God. We love you, Jesus. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Remain standing with me. Gather your offering this morning. We're going to ask the ushers to come. Amen. We want everybody to keep in mind a couple of things going on tonight. Amen. All of our married couples, we are meeting at Sister Maxine's house tonight. Amen. So please see her for her address. Amen. You will not want to miss out on that. We're looking through the book, Love and Respect. We want God in our marriages. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. Also this Friday night, amen, 6, 7 p.m., 7 p.m. tonight, uh, Friday night here at the church, Pastor Ron Libby will be with us, amen, imparting the word of the Lord unto us, so please come back out, amen, Friday night, 7 p.m., and hear the ministry of Pastor Ron Libby, amen, praise God. Also, all of our hyphen, next Sunday, amen, we will be gathering together. I know we've been talking about doing a cookout or something, I think we're going to try and make that work. Amen. So please put that on your calendar. All of our young adults, 18 to 30. Amen. See myself and my wife for more information. Amen. Praise God. How many of you were blessed this weekend by our prophecy conference? Hallelujah. 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 Let us stand this morning. Father, we give you praise. We give you thanks this morning. For Lord God, you are sovereign in our lives, God. And we give you honor. We give you praise this morning. Father, we give unto you this morning from the gratitude in our hearts, oh God. We are cheerful this morning to give unto you, Lord, because we know that all things come from you, God. Bless your people this morning, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Would you march and come and give as they sing this morning? God bless you.
from Stockton, California with us in service. He has tremendously blessed us this weekend. Can you say amen? He does have some books out in the foyer. Feel free to stop out there. Amen. Let's help him sell all these things so he doesn't have to cart them all back in California. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. They will bless you. They will strengthen your walk with the Lord. One that I like especially is talks about the rapture of the church. How many of you want to go in the rapture? Where do the, where do the rest of you want to go? I said, how many want to go in the rapture? Praise God. It's low. terrible to get old, isn't it? <laughs> you get aches and pains, you don't sleep as good at night and all that. But uh, that's, uh, that's only for a short duration of this journey in life. Because God has a new body for all of us. And uh, it's going to be a great day when that happens. But, uh, but I love Brother Overton and his family. I had, I had Michael as one of my students. That really makes me feel old, and uh, and uh, so I just actually I've had several that I've seen here as my students, and I was looking for his Brad here this morning. Let's see him anywhere out? Did he leave us today? He's here. He stepped out. See, call his name, and so we all look at him when he walks in. Oh, uh, oh, he's back there, hiding back there. So. But, you know, the, um, the kingdom of God, it is made to perpetuate itself through generations. 
And everything that God does is based on generational succession. And without the generational succession, the church would not exist today. And the succession for the church started about uh, A.D. 32, A.D. 33. Uh, if our calendar is correct and accurate, we know that there's maybe days or even sometimes a year with the leap years that get us messed up. And then we know that some timing is based on the lunar, lunar calendars rather than the solars. And, uh, but somewhere about the 19 to 1800 years ago for sure, maybe 2,000 years ago, that's a long time for succession. The Jews, they go back and they base theirs um, about 4,000 years. And it's amazing every time you step off the plane in Israel and you walk down the gang plane, you go up and you go around this deal and you step and there's this big glass uh, wall when you come to the airport and you look down at all the people getting ready to fly out and most of them are Jews or tourists and then you walk outside and you're in a land that was desolate for hundreds of years and now it's populated and there's Jews everywhere you go in Israel and that means a lot of different things to a lot of people but what it means to me is that God is faithful and that his word is the greatest gift that he's ever given us because it gives us hope that is perpetual. And um, I mean, I, I can walk off that plane, step into Israel, look at those Jews. They have no idea why I'm emotionally stirred just by looking at them. And, uh, but the reason I'm, I'm stirred is because of what it means to me. And I'd like to read in Deuteronomy. Day, uh, chapter 30, and this is a prophetic passage, but uh, we're not going to so much look at that aspect. We want to look at its application to the church. Uh, verse 1 says, And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I commanded thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Thank you. You may be seated. Looking at uh, Deuteronomy 28, it um, tells us a little bit about what these verses that we read in chapter 30 are referring to. And uh, in Deuteronomy 28, that chapter, it says, It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Now imagine being a people that was not really a people. They were the descendants of a man by the name of Abraham and a woman by the name of Sarah. And God met with Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees. And uh, why he was in Ur, he heard something we don't exactly know how it happened maybe God took on a form a theophany and came into their shop where he worked with his dad and talked to him maybe God spoke to him with just a voice or maybe God appeared to him in a dream or maybe he was sitting there and he had a vision we don't know exactly the channel in which God spoke to Abraham 
But it was clear that God talked to Abraham and said to him, he said, I want you to get up and leave this place. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your uh, kindred. I want you to leave the business. And I want you to follow after me. And I'm going to take you to a place you've never been. And I'm going to make some promises to you that I've never made to anybody else. And so Abraham's father, Terah was his name. They were in Ur the Chaldees. That's way down in Iraq today. And it's in the southern part of Iraq, or the east part of it, I guess would be. The, uh, and they were down toward the Gulf there. And uh, they, um, they were working there, and they didn't move. There was no movement. Abraham and his father continued to work there. His dad was an idol maker. And that was one of the centers of prosperity of that era of time, about 4,000, 4,100 years ago. All the ships would come down the Euphrates or the Tigris River. Uh, the people would come out of the mountainous regions. They would come up through the Arabia, follow the Oasis Trail. And there they would come, and that was a center of civilization. That is where Sargon the first established the kingdom. That's where the Sumerian language, not the Sumerians, but the Sumerian language, which is an older people, a non-Semitic language. They were visited and they were inner, uh, uh, they lived with a group of people that were Akkadians. The Akkadians were a Semitic people, so they had a non-Semitic people and a Semitic people. And in uh, about 300 years, Sargon's kingdom came to naught and the Akkadians rose up, but they didn't fight amongst themselves. They actually worked well together, and the Sumerian language kind of went into a dormant stage in the Akkadian language. And today, the oldest language that we have written that we use and understand is the Akkadian language. It's the oldest Semitic language where most of the languages in existence have some kind of touch to that. We do know that hieroglyphics were in effect with Egypt, but they did not have syllabic sounds at that time. They only had picturic stories, where the Akkadian was a syllabic language that had some form of phonetic sounding with it. It had an alphabet of 627 characters. They were cuneiform, which is wedge-shaped. That's a lot more than we have in English. And uh, they begin to uh, uh, communicate there and they begin to talk and they wrote a lot of tablets and they wrote a lot of laws there. And those laws help us today to understand the actions of Abraham. Uh, many people, Hambria, they think that that is the oldest code, but actually there's a code that's 200 years prior to that that the code of Hambria is based off of. And so it has even more laws. And so that's the first written law. And so Abraham lived in a very law-abiding community. His family was in touch with the entire world of civilization because Mesopotamia was the cradle of civilization. And all the different groups of people came to trade and interact with that government there. And his father was a very wealthy individual. And of course, he was part of that wealth, being in the family because they made gods for all of these people. And people would come in and put their order in, what kind of god they wanted. They would build that god. Do you want it to have gold on it? Do you want it to have jewels on it? Or do you just want a nice carving and painting? Whatever, and they would put their order in, and, and his dad would build that. Now, so Abraham was familiar with all of the deities that were in the world of that day. Imagine that. A lot of times we just think of Abraham as just being called of God. We don't look at the background setting, but he was in the most prosperous area. He was from a wealthy family, and he knew the history. He knew the deities. You could talk about, what about uh, Murdoch, or what about Sin, or what about Ra? And you could talk about any of the gods that existed of that day that were worshipped by the multitude of people of those nations. And he could tell you their history. He could tell you what they look like. He could tell you how they worship them. Because that was what he did for a business is he built idols. His father not only built them, but his father worshipped them. And that's why Joshua said, your father across the river, across the flood, meaning the Euphrates, used to worship these false gods. And so Abraham did not 
get raised in a monotheistic home. He didn't get raised by parents that believed in one God. He didn't get raised in par by parents that believed in Yahweh. He got raised by a dad that built idols and worshipped many, many gods. And he was surrounded by a people that worshipped many, many gods. And he knew all about them. He knew the history of them. He knew the way to worship. He knew the way to sacrifice. He knew what the beliefs of all the people were because he interacted with them all the time. You can't build a God for somebody if you don't know a whole lot about that God. You can't build an idol and say, hey, this is your God, worship it, unless you understand that religion. And so it was his business to know the religions of the world. He knew all of the religions that were being in, used and worshipped in during that time. Now, how in the world, when you know all the religions... Most of them have demonic activity that is in the background of them. Some of it's in the forefront. People get possessed and they have priests that represent them. There's certain sacrifices. Sometimes they'll cut a goat out, take the liver out, read the liver. Other times they'll take tea leaves and other times they'll pray and they get intoxicated with the liquor and intoxicated with demon powers and then they'll prophesy. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen in these false religions and Abraham knew all about them. What made this call from God different than the other gods and why was he so intent on believing have you ever wondered that I mean that's the kind of stuff I wonder I mean the guy knows about every God in the world he knows about world religions he knows about the way people pray he knows about the deities he knows what they look like he knows what they can offer he knows what they can give him he knows what they promise he knows everything about him he even knows about the cultures of the people that worship these gods and he could make a choice to serve any God he wanted and he could have made a beautiful God, set it up in his house and that would have been one of the most beautiful deities of that day. He could have made a deity that the priests themselves would have come and offered him money for. And God said, that's the kind of man I'm looking for. And I find people sometimes as they... Pastor Haney, you just don't know where I come from. You just don't know what I've done. And I don't. I don't even understand some of the stuff people do today. That's not my job. I don't have to relate to you to get you saved. Some people think, you know, you have to know all about and have experience to be able to communicate. I'm telling you, when you preach Jesus, it works on anybody that's hungry. It works on anything and anybody. And you don't have to know all about where they've come from and get down and slobber with them and cry with them and say, I understand, I was there with you. Sometimes I just say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I just don't get it. I think it's stupid the life you're living. I think it's dumb what you did. But let me tell you, I can tell you about someone who changed your future. I can tell you about someone that change everything about you tomorrow and right now. I can't go back and join you yesterday, but I can join you today as we walk forward to the gates of heaven. And here's Abraham. He has this past. I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, I've traveled the world over on many, many occasions. I've seen deities, and I've been to temples, and I've watched. But I don't know the first thing about actually being involved in it. I remember going to a temple in India one time. It was a rat temple, and they worshiped the rat. And they walked, you walk in this temple, and I, I walked up to it. I didn't go in it. But walk up to this temple, you take your shoes off, and there are thousands of rats. And people go in there and live and pray and worship these things. I'd be putting decon out if I wouldn't get arrested. I mean, that, that's kind of my way of doing it. Take my little pellet gun and start trying to shoot those boogers. Rats are nasty. Anybody like rats? No. You like rats? You have a pet rat? You wish you had a pet rat? God deliver that girl. No. I just don't like rats. I remember coming out in the garage and I met a rat. You know, we lived down the country and I cornered this rat. I was going to get it. And that thing jumped up and screamed at me and bared its teeth. I backed up. I didn't think I could hit that thing, you know. And 
I went and got a shotgun because I was afraid I'd miss it with a single shot, you know. I need something that spreads out a little bit, you know. And I'll tell you a funny story. A rat got in our house one time. My dad, you know, he, he hated rats. And uh, I think I hate rats more than snakes. He went and got the shotgun, and in our house he shot that rat and blew a big old hole in the wall, you know. But he got that rat. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that, that's, we just don't like rats. And I'm in this temple in a third world country, and there's these people bound down and praying. And I'm up there, I mean, I'm within a couple of feet of thousands of these fuzzy little things scurrying around. And people are praying to those. People are offering sacrifice to those. Where I come from, we put decon out, we shoot at them, we get the cats after them, whatever we can do. But those people made gods out of those creatures. And you know the diseases they carry? You know, if you had a wound, if you got a cut, they would tear you apart like that. They would turn into a feeding frenzy because rats smell blood and they're like, they're, they'll, 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 they'll attack it and eat it down to the bone like prongs. I mean, they get after it. People don't know that about rats. They're very, very dangerous in masses. I went to another temple uh, where they had this Buddha. They have different Buddhas in different countries, depending on where you, what country you go to. And the priests would get, they would drink this rice wine and they would get intoxicated. And then they would go into this, uh, uh, I call it a seance, but it really wasn't a seance, but it was something. And they would call down the spirits. And uh, they would get into those and they would worship this idol and it was made of, of, of some kind of substance and then overlaid with gold and jewels and they worship it and the people would come and they would get intoxicated and we'd watch the demons come down and enter those people and when the demons would take over they would literally begin to prophesy. I was in uh, uh, Japan uh, in May and uh, I went to a, sh at a Shinto temple and I had this rope there yeah. And I didn't know what the rope was for, and uh, but it was attached to a bell. And me and my friend, we, Brother Jim Black, actually we were joking, said, yeah, they have to ring the bell to wake the God up. Well, that's exactly what they do. And we were just making a joke about it. And then a little bit later, we step back and these uh, Buddha, they're not Buddhist, but Shinto people come up. They begin to bang this thing. I think they bang it twice, and it, the, the bell rings twice, and it wakes up the spirit in that house. And then they communicate with it. I went to a place where they made gods once, and you put your order in, and uh, they were making these gods, and the guy that made the gods, he had a dog, and the dog was demon-possessed, and the dog come after us, it felt the Holy Ghost in us, and we rebuked it in Jesus' name, we were really rebuking the demon inside of that dog. That dog tried to attack us, but it was the demons, and as soon as we rebuked it, that spirit backed up and sat down. And the vessel it was in had to sit down. But, but I've seen a lot of temples. I've been to mosque where they don't have an idol, but they have a false god. I've been to the Vatican where they have more idols than any temple I've ever been in. And they're all half naked. I saw more nudity. I took my family to Italy. I was doing some research, and so I said, well, you know, we're going to save up, go to Italy with me, and took them with me, and then we decided to go to the Vatican, and we took them through the Vatican. I said, girls, close your eyes. They, they didn't know what clothes were when they carved those statues. I mean, the Pope had this elaborate collection of Greek deities, and, you know, Greek deities don't wear clothes because they celebrate the human body. It's a form of humanism and pantheism combined. And he donated them. And then another pope had his own collection. He donated. So when you walk through there, you see more pagan deities from the Greek and Roman era than you see even of the statues of Peter and Christ and stuff. And that's all in the headquarters church of, the, of Catholicism. I mean, they, they have... Right in the middle, you're walking down this hall, and they have this statue there. It doesn't have a head, and it doesn't have feet, but it has all the male organs. And thousands of people have to see that. And this is supposed to be Christianity at its finest, Catholicism. 
I met a priest there when we got through, and uh, Caesar Hernandez. My family was outside. We were talking about it. Oblis was there in front where the Pope gives his speech. He was given a speech later on that day. We were discussing about what we had seen and and the the horrors of it and the deception. And we took a set of tripod up to take a family picture and uh, there was a priest there and I was drawn to him. He was a young man from Mexico and he had finished seven, eight years of training and he was there for his visit at the Vatican before going back. And so I, he, he walked over and he was a nice man. You could tell the sincerity and I was impressed by this man. So I began to talk to him and just, just being friendly to him. And we exchanged uh, numbers and emails, and, and I said, you know, you're in the States or I'm in Mexico. I said, well, let's get together. Uh, just recently, he emailed me, and so I've been talking to him through the email. And, um, but there's a lot of sincere people in these religions is what I'm saying. This young priest, Cesar Hernandez, would make a wonderful Pentecostal preacher. He'd make a wonder Pente Pentecostal saint. He is so sincere and so serious about God. But he's been raised in idolatry and he doesn't even understand it. You don't know how blessed you are to be sitting on these pews and to know the truth that there's only one God and to know his name. Yeah. These countries are so full of blindness. There is so much spiritual darkness Everywhere you go, you see it. You're beginning to see it in America. It used to be that you could drive down the roads and you saw nothing in this country. Now we've got so many people that have come, immigrants and people from other countries, and they've brought their idolatrous practice. And if someone dies, they set a little shrine up. We have a little shrine down the road from our church where a little girl was killed. I was on my way to prayer at 4 in the morning. And she crossed out in the fog and the car in front of me hit her and she went through the windshield. She was 15 years old and her family was some kind of uh, uh, Asian descent, I don't know. But they have a shrine on the side of the road there and they keep these candles burning. It's been going on now for about seven years. Burnt down once they rebuilt it. I hate all that stuff. I like to just bulldoze it down. It's, it's dirty. It's, you know, they go to the cemetery and sit by the stone and cry and weep, but don't mess the city up. That's my opinion anyway. But where they come from, that's the way to do it. Now you're seeing crosses everywhere. Somebody dies and you see these little buildings they make. Uh, and what is it? It's their blindness. I was in a, on a train in Europe. And I was headed down from Estonia down to Western Europe, from Eastern Europe. And I sat in a compartment with a, um, an attorney for the United Nations. And uh, she, was, uh, uh, she, she was a, well, an attorney with a, some degree for international law, and she worked for the United Nations. And uh, we struck up a conversation, and she began to talk to me and about God, and, and I talked to her about God, actually. My wife was with me, and we talked to her about God. And she got really uh, short with us when we talked about God. And then she began to talk to us about the wars and about the killings and the, uh, just all the, the stuff happening in the world. And basically everything she said, she was pointing her finger at God. And she had become some kind of an atheist, an unbeliever. And if there's a God, why would he allow this? And if there's a God. And I sit there and I thought, God, how do I answer this? And it wasn't long to some wisdom came into my mind and I began to talk to her and begin to diffuse and begin to show her the error of her way. But, but the world is messed up is what I'm trying to tell you. They're into idolatry or atheism. They're into worship of false deities. And the father of faith, called Abraham, who is the father of the church, came from that kind of a background that the rest of the world presently is in today. And his dad made those idols, and he helped his dad make those idols, and he became very wealthy. 
And God shows up to him and says, Abraham, I want you to leave your family. Let me read it to you. It, it's quite a story when you know the background. Most people never talk about the background when they, when they talk about the call of Abraham. But to me, it's his background that makes the call so significant. And so we're in Genesis chapter 12. It says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Basically cut every tie in your life. So Abraham's father and him are working in Ur, and they're not moving. So the Gathians come down from the mountains and begin to attack the Akkadian and Samaritan cities and it becomes an unstable region so Terah packs his family up and says we're going up north where we originally came from from Al-Ram which today would be Syria but it's actually the 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 real name for it. Syria is a is a transliteration name that we ended up with from the Greek but in the original it would be Aram, and it comes up to that area, and that's where they live, but on the east side of the Euphrates. And they live up there, and there's more stability, and the community of Akkadian people, or the Aram people that Abraham was part of, is up there, and so there's more security. So Abraham has left an unstable region with his father. He goes up there, and he's with now the tribes and the families that is family is part of and there's more security and they still get the business that travels up and down the rivers and the four corners of the world meet there at the juncture for the land bridge to go to Egypt which was a great trading center of that day and uh, they're still getting this and God still has his call upon his life you know people don't always answer the call of God the very first time he calls them and that's why we can't give up on people and let me take it a step further. That's why you can't give up on yourself and feel like you felt God when you have felt God, but that there's no hope. Because Abraham was called in Ur the Chaldees, but he's now up in Aram, and he still hasn't obeyed God's command, or he still hasn't surrendered himself to God. And we are very fast to condemn ourselves and to condemn others when they don't respond immediately to what God says. In fact, the condemnation to ourselves when we fall or we fall off the wagon, as we like to say, or we slip back into sin or a besetting something weighs us down, we are so quick to condemn ourselves and be unable to get back up because we feel that we have ruined the opportunity for the call of God. And we say, God, I can never do get back there. I messed up so bad. Hey, Abraham, he had a call of God on his life that was tremendous, but he couldn't shake the old ties. And he moved up with his father and God has called him and he's still making idols. He's still in a household that's worshiping false gods. And God still has a call on his life. Now you know what that does for me? That gives me hope. That tells me that God doesn't give up on a person when they don't respond or mold immediately to what he's trying to do. But there's hope for a man or a woman when God puts a call out on your life, even if you're not in the moment responding to that call. And then his father dies. So now he leaves. He packs up. He says, okay, God, I'm ready to respond. Think of this. He never had the strength or the courage why his dad was alive to break ties with his family. God had to wait till his dad died before Abraham would respond to God. You know, God's had to wait a long time for many of us because we got things in our life that have to die before we respond to the call. And God doesn't say, well, they're not responding, so it's time to squash them like a bug and move on. God says, I can wait. I've been waiting for thousands of years. I can wait a few more years until they change or this situation change, and I'll work this out. And we're so hard on ourselves sometimes. 
We look at ourselves in the mirror. We know our failures. And there's nobody knows you like yourself. You may fool your wife, you may fool your husband, you may fool your children, you may fool your boss, you may fool, fool your pastor, but you will never fool God. God knows your dirty underwear. I mean, he knows it all. There's nothing you can hide from God. Everything in the closet that you think is buried, God knows it. And he's got a magnifying glass and it's all blowed up. He can see every single bit of it. And, and Abraham... He's got some problems. He's made his money in idolatry. He's got a father that is worshiping. He's got a mother that's worshiping. He's got uncles and aunts. He's got nephews and nieces that are all into idolatry. Because the Bible tells us this. History tells us this. Tradition tells us this. And all of a sudden, Something awakes inside of him when they lay his father to rest. And he says, I remember that call when I was down in Ur the Chaldees. And I'm going to try and respond to it. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know exactly how to respond. So he packed up his wife and he packed up his wealth. And his nephew said, I'm going to go along with you. And he said, let's go. Where are we going? I don't know where I'm going. But that God called me. Now the thing, as I mentioned earlier, we talked about, we started to talk about, we moved on a little bit, but I'd like to go back. How in the world do you know this is the right God? If you knew every single God in the world, you knew every form of worship, you know what that would do? That would confuse you more than help you. Sometimes people are better off not to know about all of the other beliefs out there and just get into Jesus Christ and read and study him. But he had to make a decision, which God is the right God? And he knew all about him. He made him. His father made him. He knew all the worships and, and all of the writings. And he was trying to figure out. I, I, I tend to believe he was trying to put it in perspective for a few years. He was trying to figure out this is a different God that's talking to me, but what makes him more so God than the other gods? Because he was looking to make a commitment, but he didn't know which God to make the commitment to. But when he got around to it, he never looked back. And sometimes people that take a little while to get to that place where they finally commit, they stick a whole lot more than someone that just grabs it on a whim. And Abraham was one of those that he thought it out. He knew all the gods. He must have run it down a list in his mind. He must have compared them a thousand times. And finally he said, this is the right God. I'll serve him. And so he packed up and he began to follow a God. Well, after a while, God begins to make promises to him. God says, I'm going to make you wealthy. I'm going to give you all the land. I'm going to give you a child. And he goes through this big list of things. And he keeps everything he promised Abram except the son. And then toward the end of his life, he gives him a son. And then the son has a son, has two sons. Abraham uh, uh, has Isaac. And Isaac has Esau and Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons with four Two wives and two concubines, uh, which was uh, uh, something that, that, that is not uh, permissible today in, in our society, in our church faith, but it was during that era of time. And um, so he has all these sons, and that became the 12 tribes of Israel. And out of the 12 tribes of Israel became a nation. And so they're down in Egypt, and they have the faith of Abraham, and they have the faith of of their fathers and they're in Egypt and they're coming out of Egypt. And when they're coming out of Egypt, God says, I want to tell you something before I bring you into the promised land. What I want to tell you is this, that if you will serve me and you will live for me, I will bless you. And that's what chapter 28 is all about. And so we'll read some of those blessings. He says in verse 2 of 28, and these blessings shall come on thee, and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, 
Blessed shalt thou be in the field. And he goes through and gives him many blessings. But then in verse 15, he stops and he says, But it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all the commandments and the statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field. And so the thing that one time blessed them now is a thing that curses them. Except the curses are so intense that for every blessing, God gives them three curses to counteract the blessing. And ultimately, he says, you'll walk and you'll be afraid to put your head down. You'll be scared to put your foot down because anywhere you go, you know that death is, is, is imminent for you. There'll be no future for you. And I mean, God lays it out there. Abraham was blessed in the fact that his covenant was what we call a royal grant covenant. It did not have conditions. It was based on the giver, not the recipient. But Israel's was a suzerain covenant. That was a covenant that a party went into agreement with a powerful king and they had many, many obligations. And that's what we find here in Deuteronomy or the obligations of that suzerain covenant. And so God is going. But then God remembers his covenant with Abraham to the seed and so he cannot sustain the curses without offering hope when they get through this crisis of disobedience for God could see it and so when we read Deuteronomy verse 3 chapter 30 it says and then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whether the Lord thy God hath scattered thee now let's go to Romans chapter 11 and there's a verse of scripture I want to read to you Romans chapter 11 and uh, let me get there in my Bible while you get there in yours. Romans chapter 11, and there's a few verses we want to look at today. So God has made a covenant with Abraham that has no conditions. God has made a covenant with his descendants that is full of conditions and has many curses. It says, I will basically wipe you out and scatter you around, turn you into slaves, kill your children, and destroy you as a people if you don't serve me. And then he says, but because of Abraham, my servant's sake, I'll have compassion upon you if you repent and return unto me. And then we jump into the New Testament, and many people believe that the church has replaced Israel. We have not replaced Israel, but we have been grafted into the fat of the root that Israel partakes of. Israel has yet a future. And uh, the church, when we are raptured, the Lord will turn back and work with the nation of Israel. So here we turn to verse 26 of chapter 11. And it says, And so shall all Israel be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now there's no condition in this particular writing here. This is all based upon what God is going to do for Israel, not what Israel is going to do for God. Now the exciting part here, or the, the interesting part here, is when we begin to read, it says, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. In other words, all of the people that are trying to believe in Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, and the salvation and the new birth, the Bible says that Israel was an enemy to that message. And instead of condemning them and saying, because you're an enemy, the judgment will continue to fall and you will be continually punished, the Bible doesn't say that. But what the Bible says is that they were enemies for our sake. In other words, there's a reason why they're enemies. Because if they had accepted the message of John the Baptist, you and I would not be sitting here as we are today. But we would be coming to Jesus Christ through the channel of the Jewish people that would have their kingdom set up through the messianic preaching of John the Baptist. And that was not God's plan, but God owed them that opportunity in this 
uh, uh, in that era time because of the covenants that he had made. So when he went to them, he had to offer them first the kingdom because he had promised them such in his covenants. And they rejected that. And I'm very grateful that they rejected that. I'm so glad that they did not want to accept Jesus Christ. Because if they had accepted Jesus Christ, there wouldn't be a cross in our message. If they had accepted Jesus Christ, there would have been no stripes laid on his back. If they had accepted Jesus Christ, there would be no nails in his hands. If they had accepted Jesus Christ, there would be no empty tomb. If they had accepted Jesus Christ, there would be no resurrection. Do you realize the implications if Israel had accepted the John the Baptist message? Repent and prepare your hearts for the Messiah that's coming. Can you imagine trying to have Christian church without a gospel? What would we preach, Brother Overton? I don't know. What would we do? I wouldn't be preaching you Jesus died for your sins because he would have never have died. He was sinless. And so without the crucifixion, he would be sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. We'd be getting on planes to go over there to worship him. But we would never have this intimate relationship. We would never have got the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost don't come when the bridegroom is with you. The bridegroom has to go away, but he sends the comforter. So that doesn't happen either. What would Christianity be? You know, I've thought about this. I, I, my mind may work different than others, but this is the kind of stuff I think about when I'm reading the Bible. What, what would it be like to be a Christian without a Jesus that had died and been buried and resurrected? What would it be like to pray for the sick and there not be any stripes by which we are healed? What would it be like to tell someone that Jesus paid the price for you and he is the perpetuation of your sins. He is the substitute. He was the one that took it and bare it and nailed it to the cross. I couldn't preach that to you. Neither could any other preacher. You would just have a Messiah that was a good teacher, that was the Son of God, that was the manifest of the Lord, that you followed after and tried to obey his teachings, but there would be nothing happen in the spirit that changed what the first Adam did in the garden. You have no idea how blessed you are that the Jews said, crucify him. You have no idea how blessed you are that Caiaphas, the high priest, wanted to get rid of Jesus because he was afraid of the political upheaval that would take place if this man got a Jewish following big enough for the nation to turn from them to him. And the Bible says they crucified him for envy and jealousy. They didn't crucify him because he was evil. They knew what they were doing. They were the evil ones. The Romans were the innocent ones. The masses of Jewish people that followed him, they were the innocent ones. They were stirred up by these leaders. But that Sanhedrin court, those people were wicked. They knew what they were doing. Even uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, he stood up, he said, I don't agree with you about this. You can't crucify this man. Nicodemus said, does our law condemn a man before we hear him and give him a trial? Yeah, there were a few good ones on there that stood up, but they were overruled by the mass, the 70 that sat there in the council. And they didn't believe in the resurrection, the Sadducees and Caiaphas was a Sadducee. A lot of people don't understand that. But they had bought that position. So there was a, always a, a struggle of power between those that believed in the resurrection and those that didn't. And Caiaphas didn't believe in the resurrection. And yet he prophesied that one man should die for the sins of a nation, not even understanding that he was prophesying. This tells us that God was using these men even though they were in rejection of his son and did not understand what was going on. God can use anybody to accomplish his will whether they realize it or not. 
Because if they had not been jealous and if they had not tried to crucify him, Pilate would have left him alone. Herod would have not bothered him. This was not Herod the Great that tried to have him killed. This was Herod, his son, and his son did not have the same vengeance, even though he was cruel, to destroy Jesus. And I would be a preacher of Messiah, of a Jewish way of lifestyle, if I was called to preach. But I could never preach to you the gospel that opens the prison doors and sets men and women free. We have no idea how powerful the gospel is. When Jesus came to this earth, there were thousands and thousands of people that were demon possessed in the little 300 uh, uh, square mile area that he worked. Everywhere he went, people were demon possessed. And the only hope is when they ran into Jesus. And if Jesus had never died, the only hope would be to get to Jesus. But now he's got a church that spreads out and takes Jesus to the masses. And the Bible says that they are enemies for our sake. It goes on to say, but as touching the election, this is the Jewish people here, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And oftentimes we quote that when we're talking about gifts of the Spirit and we say God gives a man or a woman a gift of the Spirit and he doesn't extract that that is not what that scripture is talking about. It is talking about a people that have been called of God that no matter what they did, God would not revoke the promise that he made to Abraham. And they were always in line for salvation no matter what they were responsible for doing to the Son of God. Think about that. And the Bible says that they are loved for the father's sake. In the Greek there, it's the plural. It's the fathers. Who were the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God made covenant to Abraham, passed it to Isaac, passed it to Jacob. And he said, these people are going to be punished for breaking the law. These people are going to be scattered because they've went into idolatry. These people are going to go through hell on earth and they're going to have a terrible life. But when it's all said and done, I cannot forget the promise that I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I still love them. And they're saying, crucify him. And he says, I love you. They're saying, destroy this man. We don't want him. Let his blood be upon our hands and upon our children. And he says, I still love you. There's nothing you can do to make me hate you Jewish people. There's nothing you can do to make me, the God of heaven, turn my back upon you. Yeah, I may punish you. Yes, I may scatter you. But ultimately, I love you too much because I remember Abraham. I remember Isaac. I remember Jacob. And there's nothing that you will ever do that will cause me to reject you. That's why covenant theology is so dangerous. Because it takes away this story that we have of the restoration of the nation of Israel. That's why there's such an attack on the system of dispensationalism in the theology schools of the world. They want to wipe out dispensationalism because that system has a place for the Jewish nation. And it's crept into our own circles and many of our people going to these seminaries and getting their degrees, they're throwing away the system of dispensationalism. They, have, they, 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 they don't understand what it's all about. It's about the grace of God that never stops flowing. Covenant theology doesn't have a consistent grace. It bases it upon the merits of a person and a relationship of a trinity. I remember dealing with a person that had got into covenant theology and they did not even understand what covenant theology was. They thought covenant, that's a nice, great sounding word, isn't it? Covenant theology, oh, that's, that's, that's got to be much, dispensation don't sound very good, but covenant does. You know what the covenant is? It's a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. 
and then an outgrowth all these other covenants, but all of them are based on the Trinity. It is not based on a oneness doctrine. But Paul writes here of dispensations. He uses the term. Of course, the Greek word is translated as steward. It's translated as manager. It's used as nouns only one time as a verb in Luke chapter 16, verse 2. The rest of it's in nouns or, or in different forms. And the Greek, of course, has the case endings which tell us a lot about the way it's usage. But it's the management or the stewardship of something God gives to us for a season of time until God takes us. And God gives different people. He gave Abraham stewardship over a truth. He give the church. He give Israel. And he's going to turn back to Israel and require management and stewardship. And that's what the millennium is all about. And here he says, I want you to know something, church. You may think that I'm through with Israel, but I'm not through with them. Because I love those people. And I said, Father, forgive them. I said it about the Romans, and I said it about the high priests that were standing there wagging their tails, their, their, their tongues and their heads at me, saying, if you be the Son of God, come down. And I said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Yes, they were full of hate. Yes, they were full of envy. Yes, they were full of jealousy. But they had no idea what they were really doing. What they were doing was they were opening up the prison doors as the veins of Christ bled the blood of Emmanuel. The prison doors of hell no longer could hold those that were inside. As the stripes were laid on his back, the sicknesses that were taking people down now could be healed. As the nails held him to the cross, there was something in that physical body that when he said it is finished, it went way beyond that little group of people that stood at Golgotha's heel and looked on a man that was just uh, just a normal looking person, so to speak. Uh, but it had some long reaching effect into 2017 in this city, in this church, in this world that we live in, letting people get out of prison. And the Bible said, for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. What does that mean? That means that I called Abraham and I made promise to his seed. And I said to his seed, I shall never forget you. I will never let you get away from me. And so I called you and I chose you. And no matter what you do, it's not based upon what you did. It's based on my word and my relationship with the covenant that I made with Abraham. And so therefore, I will not allow the devil to destroy the seed of Abraham. I will not allow the devil to wipe out the Jewish people. And I find so much inspiration when I read the story in the book of Ezekiel. And I love to get to chapter 37 when Ezekiel prophesies to the boneyard. And people like to make that a metaphor. And they like to make that an allegorical. That was not a metaphor. That was not allegorical. That was a literal happening where God called a prophet and said, I want to take you into the place and show you the bones of a people that are no longer going to be a nation. And when he prophesied to them, you have to remember Israel was together. Why am I prophesying to a people that are not scattered but are gathered? And he said, I'll take you out of the graves. That means the nations that they, he had sent them to. The Gentile nations were like graves to the Jewish people. He said, I will gather you back into your homeland. You will no longer be two sticks but one stick. And meaning you will no longer be Judah and Israel, but you will now be one nation as you were before the split took place. God prophesied this, and they're a whole nation. Everything's fine with them. And Ezekiel's prophesying this because God knows how to put a word out there before you ever go through the situation that you'll need that word. That's why there's things in the Bible that were written 2,000 years ago that had you in mind when you face hell today. And the devil knows that, but he tries to make us feel that God has cast us away and God is not interested in us. Verse 30, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. What Israel did for us was it give us the key and a pass to the throne of God. And what we did for Israel and are doing for Israel is we are provoking them to jealousy. Every time you come to the house of God and you lift your hands, 
every time you pray in the Holy Ghost that was prophesied to them in Joel, but we got grafted in and took it before them. Every time you call on the name of Jesus, their Messiah, but now he's your Lord, you're provoking the Jew to jealousy. God used their unbelief to get us saved, and now he's using us to get them interested in what they rejected. And he's using both of us to do something that no one else is doing. To hold on to the eternal truth that hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And that's the terror of hell. That's the terror of hell. Yeah, there's a lot of gods out there. And he's got masses of people that are blinded. But God has always had a people. And God will always have a people. And I'm one of those people. You're one of those people. Verse 31 says, Even so have there is also now not believe that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Now it's getting juicy. Every time a Gentile comes down to the altar and he calls or she calls on the name of God and says, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Every time a saint that has slid back and fell into sin and they come down and they say, God, forgive me, I've messed up and I've failed and I need to be washed and I need to be cleansed. God has a twofold purpose in taking those sins away. One is that he loves you as a Gentile and he wants to save you. But two, when he saves you, it obligates him to save them. Because God is no respect of a person. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He told them in Malachi chapter 3, he said, I am the Lord and I change not. And because I don't change, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Often we like to quote, God changes not, but it's in the context of God not destroying the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob. And because what God did for Israel, God has to do for the church. And then when God does it to the church, God has to do it for Israel. And when God does it for Israel, God has to do it to the church. It's a never-ending cycle that the mercy of God can never stop flowing because God's blood has been shed. And when God's blood is applied to one life, any that call on that name can have that same appropriation to them. And one day all of Israel shall be saved. Verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. The unbelief of the Jew opened the mercies of God eternally. Now, let's read this last part. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Who could have thought up such a plan? To present himself to his own and his own received him not. Knowing that the rejection of those that were of his own flesh and blood was the salvation of those that were dogs outside the kingdom. I couldn't have thought of a plan like that. I'd have been trying to find a way to save myself. I'd have been trying to find a way to make this thing work without having to go through Calvary. If I was Jesus, I'd have been trying to find a way to get Israel to like me. But see, God, he doesn't have a counselor. He's not on the same level as you and I. That's why it says, how unsearchable are his judgments. He made a judgment call. He made a decision. He brought justice to the universe. And people said, that's not going to work. Your death 
and rejection of the Jews, that that just don't make sense. And so much that the Bible says of the princes of this world, it said in Corinthians, it said, if the gods of this world had known, if the princes of this world, yeah, that refers to the Romans, it refers to Herod, but it is referring to the spirit world that controlled them. And if those demon powers had known what they were doing when the Jews said, they were stirring those Jews up, they were stirring Pilate up, they were stirring those Roman soldiers up, they were stirring those people up. Yeah, the, the Sanhedrin was stirring them up, the council was stirring them up, but they were all being manipulated by the demon powers of hell. And they foolishly played right into the hand of the Almighty because their wisdom is, cannot compete with the wisdom of God. Their knowledge cannot obtain the understanding of such great wisdom as God's wisdom. I'm talking about hope today. When God calls you, God hath called all to repentance. That call is not revoked you do in life. It's not revoked what the devil does. The only one that could revoke that would be God. And God refuses to revoke it because he is the Lord and he changes not. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto them again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. He alone is worthy. He alone had a plan. No one else could redeem the creation. No one else could redeem what God had made in the beginning. And I want to tell you, God may have saved you and you may have wrecked your life. Or you may be here and you've never been saved and you still wrecked your life. And you think that God doesn't know. Well, you just don't know, preacher, what I've been through. You just don't know the kind of mess I've, you don't know how I fell into sin. You don't know how many people I hurt because of my lifestyle. I hear that kind of stuff. I hear people that give up on themselves. I hear people that give up on others. But I want to tell you, I know a God that doesn't know how to give up on anybody. I know a God that doesn't know how to pull back and take his mercy and remove it from somebody's life. I know a God that you can walk out and crucify him. And he'll still forgive you. I know a God that you can say, let this be the history. Let this be the, the capstone of who we are. The people that crucified Jesus Christ. And God says, there ain't enough sin in the world. There ain't enough rejection in the world. There ain't enough failure in the world to stop my love and my mercy for you. I am the Savior. And because of this, someday there's going to be a trumpet that is going to sound. And the church is going to be taken to heaven. And the Jewish people are going to be left here on this earth. Still in unbelief for the most part. But something unique is going to happen. God begin to work with them again and open their eyes and their understanding. And why Enoch was translated before the flood, Noah, type of the church or type of Israel, was preserved through the flood. What I'm trying to tell you is that hell will never have one victory in its entirety if a man or a woman will believe in God's grace. Amen. I remember 
visiting with a pastor that was an ex-pastor who had fallen into homosexuality. That's sins I don't understand. Somebody says, Pastor Haney fell into adultery. Pray for me. They tell you, I fell into sin with a man. It's a lie. It just isn't in my nature. I don't understand the homosexual mind. I don't understand that kind of filth, that unnatural affection. I just don't get it. But I reach people that are living there. Last Sunday, I had a man that has been a homosexual for about 15 years, eaten up with sexually transmitted diseases, in my altar crying like a little boy. I went down and put my arm around him. I said, this is a new beginning for you. I know a God that's going to take you and rescue you and pull you out of that mess. Yeah, I hate homosexuality. But I hate the devil that puts these people in that worse. And I hate them, all of that. And I know that God is able to deliver them. And I, I was visiting, talking to this ex-pastor. And he told me the story, how he had his first encounter. We didn't go into detail because it was gross to him because he was trying to come back to God. And it was extremely gross to me. But he told me the basics. And he looked at me. And he said, I come to the altar, I can't feel God. Wherever there's a move of God, I go there. Wherever there's a revival, I go. He said, God will have nothing to do with me. I said, it's not God. It's how you view yourself. You think that what you've done is so bad. doesn't want anything to do with you. You are not the worst sinner in the world. And you have not committed the unpardonable sin. The sin you've committed is grave. And it's evil and it's perverted, yes. But it's not the end of the road. And if you will take the limitations off of God, right now God will forgive you and refill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that preacher that had walked away from God, walked away from a wife, walked away from his children, walked away from his church to live into a homosexual lifestyle, right there in that altar lifted his hands with the hard marks of sin all over his life. And he said, Jesus, forgive me. And the dam broke. Years of feeling I could never be accepted again because of the sin that I've committed. And the tears begin to flow. And the voice begin to well. And the hands begin to shake. And the body begin to quiver. As he felt God's presence that he felt had deserted him for years. And I'm here to tell everybody. There is only one sin God will not forgive. And it is to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And you know what happens with blasphemers? Everyone that I've ever met, and I've only met two that have blasphemed that God wouldn't forgive. They came to a place, they had delusions, and they didn't know they were lost. And they didn't want forgiveness. If you can feel you've done wrong and you can desire God to forgive you and you understand that you want to be close to God, you've not committed a sin that God won't forgive. When you get to the place you think the life you're living is right and you don't desire God to help you. And many people that say that don't really even believe that. It's just a cover up. But if you actually ever get there, you're crossing a line. You can't come back. But I've, I've just, not, I've lived 51 years. I've been around millions of people now. And I've only soon seen two people that I think 
have committed the unpardonable sin. But I've never met anyone who felt guilty and condemned that he had committed the unpardonable sin. Because when you go to that length, you will no longer feel bad about what you've done. Someone says, Pastor Haney, why are you talking to us about this? First, it's a great Bible lesson that every Christian should know about. It's a truth about Israel and about the church. And we need to have truth. It supports and undergirds and gives reason to the fact that we believe in a future for Israel because of what it, the impact that it has upon the church. But on an individual base, every one of us, somewhere in life, are going to hit a brick wall. And we're going to feel we can't go any further because of what we've done, not what God's done. And the condemnation is going to set on us so heavy. I want you to remember this morning's message. That there is nothing that can stop you from getting right with God. There's nothing that can take you away from the relationship that Jesus set in place for you. The last verse says, All things to whom be glory forever. Amen. The word amen means let it be so. I'd like the music to come. Would you just close your eyes a moment? I want you to think of all of your failures and your weaknesses. Someone says, well, I don't have any sins in my life. I'm not talking about sins. I'm talking about human shortcomings, ungifted areas of our life, weaknesses, instabilities. I don't know about you, but to be real open and honest before you there's things in my life that I'm not real happy about there's areas in my life that I want to do better in the future there's things in my life that I wish they were different and no we're not talking about sin we're talking about just being a human being But God never gives up on us. We give up on ourselves. If you could see how God looks at you, I ask you to look at yourself for a moment. That's the human eyes. There are people that can't see any fault in what they do. Everything they do, they have a false sense. But most of us, honestly, we don't tell people. We don't want people to know. But when we look in the mirror, when we look in our heart, there's so much we wish we could be that we haven't yet attained. But when God looks at you, He doesn't see that failure, that inability, that ungiftedness. But He sees a covenant that is in place. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of his wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his way past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto them again. For of him and through him and by him, and that's the key, has nothing to do with us, but has everything to do with Jesus. Nothing to do with me, everything to do with him. Nothing to do with you. And so today, if you want to be more for God than you presently are, and there may be sin in some of your lives, I mean, uh, 
anytime you get more than a couple of people, there's going to be some people that have struggled through the week. It's not the end of the road, but it's the beginning. It's the beginning of hope. It's the beginning of hope. Israel, what you do wrong to be in Babylon, we forgot God. It wasn't so much that they sinned, but it was that they forgot God. And the reason they went into captivity was so they could remember God. Because when you begin to remember God, changes begin to happen. Amen. So at this altar call today, you that want to go deeper into the mercies and the grace of God, you that want to Find victory this week over something that you've limited yourself to being victorious over. I want to invite you to come and gather around the front for prayer today. I invite you to come gather around and say, Jesus, here I am. It's going to be a great day this afternoon when I leave this altar today. I'm going to have more hope than I've had before. I'm going to understand the mercies of God. I'm going to be something more than I've ever been because of who you are and the plan that you've set in place for my life. Hallelujah. Just come gather around the front. Let's talk. Church, just come gather around. Hallelujah. Here we are today, Jesus. Here we are surrendering ourselves to you again. We're so in love with you, Lord. We want you. We need you. We desire you. You're the greatest thing that we've ever had. And we've come today, God, to acknowledge the 